If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Oh, I'm excited. I'll tell you what. I'm excited. Chris Pfaff, uh, otherwise known as Drama, um, was very different because I didn't know much about him like you did. Like... I know you've been following him for a while. Past this is why Robin I, Big. This is why I get a little geek. This one was cool, man, for me. This was a big, you know, we talk about milestones in our business and and things that, you know, and I'm not. I definitely am definitely not the guy who gets starstruck or weird or nervous around people that like maybe I watched or that were famous. Like so, none of that. But there's definitely this respect level, and there's also this wow, this is really cool that we're here because. I spent many years watching him on Robin Big and Fantasy Factory and you know Rob Deirdrick and him are both two guys that I'm super impressed with what they've done not just from the the reality show because that doesn't impress me what impressed me when somebody takes that from a reality show they pivot and they and actually turn it into a business and they build an empire mm-hmm. you know and Rob has done that and you see Chris right now building his and man what a cool story. Yeah, I was, because uh, I didn't know much about him. I knew him from Robin Biggs as drama. And when we met, I was uh, very pleasantly surprised. The guy's super intelligent dude, very self-aware. We have great conversations uh, in this podcast. You got to see yeah. where it turns. I'm really curious where, if, as a listener, as you're listening through this, pay attention and tell me where you think it turns. Because, you know, when we set this up, Brianna was telling me, like, you know, Chris was really hard to book because... He was very uncertain to do the podcast with you guys. You know, a bunch of fitness meathead guys. You know, he's not a big fitness guy. He didn't want to talk about working out and fucking nutrition the entire time. So you could tell that when we first sat down to start this interview, that there's this little bit of like, uh, not excited. I don't know where this is going to go. And then there's definitely a turning point in the episode where you can just tell we we're just having a great conversation mm-hmm. with a couple guys. So uh, you're going to hear us talking to Chris Pfaff again. His podcast is short story long. Uh, he's at Drama on Instagram and Facebook, and his clothing line is youngandreckless.com. So without any further ado, here's Chris Faff. Dude, uh, super excited to uh, sit down and talk to you. So I um, a, I was a huge Robin Big fan as a kid. Thank you. And yeah, and that was the, the first time, I, and I have, I have bulldogs and everything, so yeah. I was that big that big of a fan. You went all in. And uh, I, I, remember, I remember you being I almost sh- bought a mini horse. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you being on the show, and then I remember watching Fantasy Factory, and then I remember uh, watching you like start your business, kind of come along, man. Yeah. And mm. I kind of want to start us there, so kind of for those fans that may not know you, you. Yeah. Uh, what was that like at that age, being on a, a reality show and becoming kind of a reality star, and then uh, then breaking off? Yeah. Yeah. So at, at that age, it was absolutely insane. I mean, I came from Akron, Ohio, which is very, uh, very small town, very slow, very. You know what I mean? I, it, it, not a lot going on. Yeah. Definitely not anything like filming a crazy MTV show. So I came here at eighteen, right on the edge of nineteen. Um, and that stuff happened pretty quick. Like right when I got here, they were working on the pilot for what would become Robin Big. And, you know, that whole process took kind of a while. It took close to a year from filming the pilot to it actually airing on TV. But right. it was pretty quick that there was like MTV people in the in the house, in the living room, and there's cameras everywhere. And it just got real weird real quick. Yeah. You know, and it's like, man, LA is weird. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it still is weird. It still is. But that was like I got like the shock treatment. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. I got like, welcome, here you are, and weird MTV show. Yeah, so in, yeah. Yeah. So um and then obviously that kind of went off. It became this massive hit, you know, which was another super crazy feeling because I remember one of the executive producers coming to us who um did Jackass and he said, you know, uh in a couple months, you guys when you're walking down the street, people are gonna recognize you and this is gonna change, you know, forever right. um, and and I remember us thinking that was so not possible like it was just like no yeah. man like yeah. come on like, it's like not, I'm a regular guy yeah you know, like it's mean? just like we yeah. had no goals of being famous or being like reality stars you know it was just like I don't know bro thanks for the heads up but I don't think so anyway so the show obviously became this massive hit um, and you get these weird you get such a crazy reaction from people because they feel like they really know you yeah. you know like it's different than like for instance Tom Cruise is way more famous than we ever were but if you see him walking through a mall you're not going to run up on him and say like yo man I love that one you know what I mean because you don't know him you know the character right um, with us they 
they feel like they are in your house. They know your dogs. They know your, you know what I mean? They know everything. What so. a great point. That is a big difference between reality star versus yeah. somebody who's doing like an acting. I didn't even think of it, how different it is. You probably get more people trying to butt into your shit. They than relate you. really hard oh to what you're God. doing and, and all that. And I didn't, you know, like... I, I don't care because I always took it very lightly, but like I didn't. One thing I didn't think about is with my role being like the little homie getting picked on on every right. I'm everyone's mm. favorite little homie. Mm-hmm. I was now I'm everyone's little homie every time I'm walking through the mall. Oh, right, fuck. so it's like drama. Get out of here, man! What the hell are you doing? And what? Like, what? Who are oh, you? Oh shit! Did you? Did I ever fuck with you at that <laughs> age? Yeah, like nothing crazy. Like nobody ever like like tried Somebody, to like, give me a wedgie or, or anything. Yeah. yeah, like let me <laughs> give you a swirly. But like it was uh. just the attitude of like, oh drama. What are you doing here, man? And you're like, well, who are you? Like they're you know people. Are talking to you like they really know you all the sensors in your brain go off of like oh who is this person but they don't so that's kind of like everyone treats you with the same dynamic that you're treated on the show Hmm. Um, so it was a real weird crazy thing crazy time as a whole dude talk about how hard that must be to try and break from that it was hard and i'm and i'm gonna be honest it uh it, not that it was some big horrible thing like oh my god I was I was the little homie and it ruined my life uh, but there was this element of like okay this was really fun um, I was able to make some money and launch this company but it is important to me to I don't need to be taken too seriously but I do want people to see me as a business owner and I want them to listen to my podcast and think that maybe I'm having decently intelligent conversations and there's some value. You know, you want to break out of that and have mm-hmm. people kind of think of you that way. If they're always just thinking thinking of you as uh, as the butt of the joke, obviously you can never scale that into anything. So mm. it was a process. And, and there were definitely times when I, you know, felt a little like beat up by it. You know, like mm-hmm. I felt like, man, I just... I positioned myself one way to millions of people, and that's really hard to conquer. Yeah, but yeah. I do feel like finally, you know, it's probably a couple of years ago that it really shifted, and that I think people now more think of me for running Young and Reckless and for you know, kind of the whole history of everything we've done, mm. um, as opposed to that. So you still get it a little bit, which now it's more fun. But yeah, um, yeah it was a process. But did you, you have intentions the whole time, like getting on the show of like? you know, marketing this, this clothing line in your head or did that just like happen as... So here's what it was in my head. It was like, we moved here and I remember there was a moment when Rob... So I wasn't really supposed to have anything to do with the show. Originally, I was just around because uh, I was I had just moved here and my goal was to get a job at a skate shop and get a hopefully a studio apartment. That was my life dream, right? <clears throat> so then the show kind of started happening. There was a moment when Rob had a guy scheduled to be his assistant. Um, and he quit. He called and said he couldn't do it. And Rob said, do you want to be my assistant? And I'm like, man, I don't even know what a personal assistant is or does. Mm-hmm. I don't know my way around this city. Like, I have no idea what that means. And all of our friends uh, came to me and said, man, don't do it. Because he's really, when he's working, he's really serious. And they're like, it's going to ruin your relationship with mm-hmm. him. Like, you don't want to mix that. Like, sure. Just yeah. don't do it. And and I remember him saying, like, look, man, if you want to be involved in any of this shit that we're doing, you know, this show and all this stuff that we're doing, this is how you do that. You know, there's no other. If you're working at a skate shop, yeah, we can be friends, but like you're not going to be involved in this fun stuff that we're doing. Um, and so I just knew like I wanted to be involved. Like yeah. I wanted to be around the action. Are you already into fashion and pop, pop culture at this time? Yeah, like in the – yes, but not – I mean – I would be lying if I said my real passion is was to start a business and to be an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. not to change the fashion game. Even right? then. Yeah, even then. Wow. Even then. I always wanted to be I always saw myself as like this entrepreneurial um person and that's what I always wanted to do. Not it was never that. My early dreams were to be a professional skateboarder, but it was never like a fashion thing. I cared, I liked it, I cared how I dressed. I was a skater and all my jeans had to be perfect and I would stretch my shirts out so that they were the right length and yeah, all that stuff, but nothing crazy. So what happened was, I'm sorry I'm rambling a little bit, but I I knew I wanted in on the action. So I got I started working for Rob did whatever I could to fit into the dynamic that was Robin Big. Um, the first thing I started doing was making beats, making music. And so I um, I put a lot of the music on the background of Robin Big. A lot of the like background weird little jingles mm-hmm. were mine. Oh, oh those are yours. Yeah, right yeah. And so that was my thing was like I would just give that to the executive producers and be like, mm-hmm. here, please use these, please, please, please. And they did me favors because those original ones were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hear, like if you ever listen to a Robin uh, Big like uh, uh, rerun and you just hear some terrible ringtone in the back, that's drama. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but um, and then you know we did Bobby Light the Bobby Light song because yes. I was in the you house. Did that one? Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that yeah. Was so, epic. Epic. so that was my first thing. Anyway, getting to the point when Fantasy Factory started, I was like, okay, this is my opportunity to really 
launch something um, because it was just me and Rob at that point. And I just saw how clothing was like the perfect thing. It was there was a chain of retailers that where all the kids shopped who watched the show, being PacSun, Zoomies, Tillies, right? It was dead on. You could ship straight to them before e-com, obviously. Um, and I could wear it on the show. I could market it. I could. It just fit perfectly. That product fit perfectly with that marketing uh, platform. Yeah. And so that's when I came up with the name and the concept and um, and figured it and out. And Rob was real supportive of, of you doing that as far as like branding yourself and doing all that. Yeah, and I always tell this story, and, and, I, and I hope that it always comes off right, because what happened was, so when, when Big Black launched his uh, clothing line on Rob and Big, um, Rob helped him out a lot. He introduced him to a guy at DC who helped him with distribution and did all that stuff. So naturally, when... When I had the idea to do a clothing line, I went to him and I said, "Hey, man, here's my idea. Like, hook me yeah. up." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I saw it happen here. Yeah, like, <laughs> where do I cash the check? And uh, <laughs> and he was, he essentially said, "Look, man, if you want to do it, go do it. Like, you're a smart guy. You can figure it out. I don't have the time to do it. Like, I just, mm. I can't help you." Okay. And I remember at the time being like. Did you resent him a little bit? Hate me, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I was just like, why would you not? You know, and I I didn't want to push back. I was never that type of guy, but I was just like, shit, man. Like I've seen you help Big Black, and I've seen you help these other people, and um, but I I didn't hold any like real resentment. But it forced me to go figure it out and to go meet my business partners, who I'm with now, and to really learn it and figure it out. And to be honest, if he would have said, "Hey, DC, um, do this line for drama," it would have been gone right now. I mean, DC's went bankrupt mm-hmm. not too long ago but um but also it just would have died it, there would have been no it wouldn't have been an actual business mm-hmm. i wouldn't have been invested in it i wouldn't mm-hmm. have known how to run it um and so i'm really really thankful for that and then like a year ago he came to me because now we're a lot closer he came to me and said Man, i'm gonna be honest i just thought it was whack <laughs> <laughs> he's like i just he's like I, it was I, a I, stupid idea yeah, yeah, yeah. he's uh, like he's like i just thought the name was i just thought it was kind of whack he's uh, like now it's like the uh he's like he, he was kind of talking about like wanting to invest you know that's he's a like, true it's, friend now right it's, there it's the yeah. really successful it's the successful <laughs> business that came from the show you know he's like now yeah. i wish i blew it you know oh, but, that's great but he's like at the time i just i just thought it's <laughs> and you're like you can't invest now motherfucker yeah and i was like no there's no place for you <laughs> yeah yeah so as a fan of the show, I remember watching it. One of the things that I was drawn to was, uh, as far as reality shows, I felt it was the most real. Yeah. Did you, was it really that it real? Was. I felt like you guys, even when you guys bickered a little bit or yeah. he frust- you were frustrated with him, I felt like it felt real. 100%. Yeah. So I'll tell you how it went down. Number one, all of the f- crew that always worked on the show always said... This is the realest reality Bro, show. Bro, I'm yeah. uh, just someone who's a fan, yeah. and I felt that, dude. Yeah. You could just tell. Yep. And um, and so the way it went down is this: we would uh, there'd be some crazy idea that either came from something that was really happening, something Rob saw online, something Big Black was doing. Like you know, something would come up, um, and they'd be like, "Man, that's an episode. Like that could be an episode." So what we're gonna do is we're going to. Um, you know, obviously, we'll show you getting into it or, or discovering it. Uh, we'll go meet with this person. I think that'd probably be a good gem. And then the ending is us doing a party to celebrate the launch of the right. So they would structure it in TV form, right, right. Um, but every moment was just whatever happens, happens. Who's the creative genius behind that? Rob. Yeah. Rob is one million percent. Rob. Wow. He is a genius. Man. When it comes to that. I mean, wow. he conceptualized. Nine, I mean, ninety-eight percent of every single episode. Wow! There was a really good team of executive producers and stuff to kind of help him clean it, or to say like, "Well, we don't really know how to Give a put a button structure. on this scene, or, right, or transition I mean? it, or something mm-hmm. like that." Yeah, and they were also really good at like, you know, there was one time the famous episode where we got attacked by sharks. Well, he really let one <laughs> bite him. I just screamed, but uh, <laughs> uh, we, that came from driving in the car, just him and I driving in a car, shooting an episode, and there's the cameras in the car, but we weren't. We were just talking shit, and he, we were just driving by the ocean, and he said, how much would it take for you to get attacked by a shark? And I'm like, no price. Like, there's, there's, <laughs> right, it's not happening. Not a yeah. number for that. No. And he's like, but no, wouldn't thanks. it be cool? Like, what if you knew it wouldn't, like, really mess you up, but just, like, a scar or something? Like, how you know, 10 grand, 15 grand? I'm like, zero chance, no mu- no dollar amount, not taking the risk. So anyway, by the time we, he's like, man, I think it would be cool. I think I would do it. Yeah. By the time we got out of the car 10 minutes later, the producers ran up to us and said, hey, we have a place in the Bahamas. We can do a whole episode about this if you want. And we're like, well, okay. He oh, was like, let's shit. do it. So that's how like an episode would Dude, every wow. I think every 17-year-old to probably almost 30-year-old at that time thought, this probably what I thought, which was, if I had all the money in the world, this yeah. is yeah, exactly that's how I would do it. This is yeah. how I would spend yeah. it. Did you exactly? Well, especially uh, Fantasy Factory. That oh. was that was one of those things. I was loving how you know, you, like everything. It was like all this fun shit going on, but everybody's working, and yeah, that was a that was a crazy dynamic. It was cool, man. I'm gonna be honest. Like there was a part. This this might make me sound a little stupid, but like 
there was a part of me that didn't realize how much fun we were having mm-hmm. until until we stopped. Right. You know what I mean? And like in the sense of we didn't like the actual process of filming, you know, of having to go every day at, for the whole day. Uh, you can't really have your phones on you because you have mics. Like, it's a little bit tedious mm-hmm. some days. Um, and obviously, we didn't care at all about, like, the fame or the any of that stuff, right? So there were days when we were like, ah, oh, this is just, you know, we just don't feel like doing it today. The point is, it wasn't until it was over where I'm like, man, we really, like that. It was like we had, like, a blank check and, like, could just... and. Because you have this budget, you have an MTV budget, yeah. and you have a team of producers and creatives to help you figure out how to actually do it. Right. So any idea, they'll figure out in 10 minutes where you can go do it and what the different options are. Like, <laughs> what, what was your favorite one? Oh, man. Uh, remember the, the lotto? I remember that was hilarious. Uh, God, you guys have done so many great, great fucking ideas. Yeah, cause, and there's so many different... Um, there's different, man. Like when we did the, some of the original episodes with Big Black and and his Bam Bam and his friends and Uncle Jerry came out from Alabama. I don't know if you remember that or not. That yeah. was during the uh, Bobby Light Dirty Girl episode. Those were so fun just because it was like, it was just homies hanging out. Yeah. Like it was just so, so, so real. I, but I would also say like, you know, I got, there was an episode where I got shot out of a cannon uh, <laughs> that was like one of the scariest things of my life. But yeah, like yeah. being able to have the opportunity to do that, right, you know, right. is like insane. <laughs> also scuba diving with sharks. Like we didn't have, we didn't have any sort of um, lessons or yeah. anything. They took us in a above ground pool for 30 minutes, said, here's how you take your regulator out. Here's how you put it back in. All right, here we Good go. Good luck. And like you're 60 <laughs> feet down the on a shipwreck. Yeah. 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 No problem. Um, so I don't, I don't know, man. There were just so many. I could name a million. There were so many good yeah. experiences. When did, you know? when did the uh, when did the urge for the the pop culture and the fashion thing happen? I mean, you're you're definitely into it now. Yeah. Did that start to really evolve in Fantasy Factory or what? Yeah, yeah. So I would say that like um, so on Robin Big, I started doing the music stuff, and obviously that kind of gets you into pop culture world a little bit. But Fantasy Factory is just where I, you know, I think that I was probably twenty two or maybe 23 when that started and so naturally that's just when i started to like you know 19 to 22 i i say that i was just figuring out what la even was you know what i mean mm-hmm. and, and what it was even not living in ohio was like so at that age is when i really started kind of growing up and getting into whatever i was into and it i just kind of went in that direction you know like i was always into like rap and rappers and that sh- that stuff growing up um and it, this is just was my like adult version of it, you know, and yeah. and I put the studio in the Fantasy Factory, and also like what happened was, you know, every so the way it happens in in this weird world of LA is when you have a show, and obviously you have a place as cool as the Fantasy Factory, every celebrity would reach out to come see it, sure, just, just to hang out, just yeah. to hang out, and you would yeah. get these weird calls, you know, that people just wanted to come see. It. Like I remember the I remember one day my friend of a friend of a friend called and said, hey, Little Wayne wants to come skate. The Fantasy Factory. And this is when Lil Wayne was the biggest celebrity in the world. Yeah. And he you're into a, rap. And I'm into rap. And I'm into skating. And he, this guy is like an alien, you know? And so I'm like, oh, man, okay. And so um, I go down. There. I end up going down by myself. Um, and I go down. And his enti- his tour bus pulls up. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, much of smoke comes out. Yeah, like, yeah. A, like a <laughs> UFO lands and like yeah. whatever. And then, and then he hops out with his skateboard. And he's like, oh, what's up, drama? And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like the alien That's knows who I am. Yeah. Alien. <laughs> what the hell? And um and and, it, and then he just went and skated for three hours and and that had to been crazy because Little Wayne at that time too was just just yeah, he massive. Was on top. massive. Yeah. So I guess what I'm getting at is I'm super rambly today. I apologize. That's but, all good. But, That's how we roll, man. Yeah, it's man. all good. <laughs> what I'm getting at is like it just became this intersection of like I'm making music. Um, I have a clothing line that I'm trying to market and get on celebrities anyway. Celebrities want to come to the Fantasy Factory. I have a studio there. I mean, at the time in the studio, I was work before they were they were nobodies. I was working with Miguel, Kendrick Lamar, YG. Wow. Um, those are just the people that were in there as these new up and coming artists. Wow. So it was just this really cool energy, and that's where all of those things kind of intersect. And it's such formidable years. I mean, those are years of growth for everybody. Yeah. Uh, how did they influence your growth as a person? I just think they taught me like the they taught me the hunger and the reality of like this entrepreneur life and like the hustle, you know, and it's like you got to reach out to the next person and ask for the favor and do the favor and connect with that person. It doesn't happen unless you ask, right? 100 percent. And it never stops. And it's still like there's still days on my podcast where I'll reach out to people. I texted Puffy the other day to see if he would do the podcast. It's the most uncomfortable (laughs) out of pocket. Like, I don't you don't need to like it's ridiculous. But you have to just ask the crazy favors sure. and like constantly. And yeah. I think that 
it taught me in that phase like what it really takes to kind of grind it out and build something in this weird world of of entertainment yeah it's all the relationships yeah yeah it's not what you know your, who you know it's always your, been that way. your net yeah. your true net worth is your net circle man yeah, yeah it's so true man and and it just never stops i think that when i was younger i had this fantasy of like hitting this made it point where everyone just comes to you and you can just do anything. You know what I mean? Like, let me just get so-and-so on the phone yeah. and I will execute. <laughs> like, and it just never happens, you know? Um, and that's where I really learned. So, hey, talk about that actually, because I bet a lot of people think, I'm sure you have got, had this before who think, Oh, well he was on this show and he's got Rob and oh, of, co yeah. of course he's successful. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure like he, they probably think it's easy to talk about the grind and the hustle for, for someone like, yeah, and then once again, that's another thing that used to, I think, bother me when I was younger, but it's like, um, I, I think now as the story play, like if Young and Reckless would have crashed and burned a few years ago, I, I probably would have had to live with that for a long time. That would have been tough. Like, you know, that would have been like, see, it was only Rob, it was a show, and like, <laughs> oh, it was, you're yeah. right. <laughs> like, no. But I think that now, like, that it's kind of evolved past that. It's been like, when you look at the whole picture, you know, and, and for me, um, the biggest, scariest part that I try to, tell young people is was when i left ohio it was it was saving up the money and mm. and filming little league football games and selling dvds to parents to try to get two thousand dollars oh you were hustling like that yeah huh? and, and i was making skate videos of my friends and selling them to the local skate shops and saying look what the kids in akron are doing mm. buy this video so i scrounged together close to five grand from these weird little odd jobs um and you're only like 18 right now or how old are you right 16 you know no shit. Wow. 16 yeah no shit and then when i was 18 i, I had a really bad uh head injury right i was i was my plan was graduate high school a month later move to LA so a week after graduating we went to this big skate park opening I fell hit my head skating fractured my skull was in a coma for four days brain oh I didn't bleeding, know that yeah, blood shit. clot in my brain so I and I woke up and I was devastated because number one I didn't know how to read or food had no taste and it was this weird thing right and um and they're like oh you have a blood clot in your brain from the fracture and you can't leave you can't go to LA you can't leave um and it messed me up. Like, it just gave me a lot of, you know, it just really bummed me out, gave me a lot of anxiety. They always said, you know, at any point you could have seizures, you could, mm -hmm. you know, these, you could have these sort of wow. after effects. It'd be scary. So the point was, scrounge all that together, moved to LA. And I remember the first week of being here, not to sound like a baby, but I called my mom every night, like, I don't think I can do this. Like, this is just too crazy. It's too out of my element. Well, dude, like, that's so extreme. Like, it's talk about so, that, like yeah. how different where you guys grew up. Because you grew up kind of like I did, like total farm town, out in the middle of nowhere, kind of small, probably everybody, you drive down one street, probably know everybody in the yes. neighborhood type of deal. 100%. It's so different. Even still now, when I go to New York, like I can only last in New York like three days. Because it's still too, too much. much. Like, yeah. Like, I've adjusted to LA, but New York is like expert level. and I just <laughs> Expert like, level. I can't get there, man. Too and, stimulating. Uh, they it, move fast. It there. is. Yeah. And you feel like you just can't get like a moment of like quiet. You know, you're always, some. there's people on top of you. So anyway, for me, it was about... Um, it was the whole process of, of getting out of my comfort zone and coming to L.A. and trying to figure it out. And when I moved here, um, Rob was a pro skateboarder. You know, he wasn't a rich celebrity. Uh, I mean, he was doing well, but um, we kind of went on this whole journey together and we built these things together. And um, that's why I think that my goal now is to really tell people what I learned and how I did what I did and share as much information as possible. Cause it's not, it doesn't help me in any way to like try to be too cool for mm -hmm. school and think that I'm some, right. you know, hot. What, what drove you to do all that? Cause those, I mean, if looking back, it, take some balls, take some balls to yeah. make that, that, that big leap from where you were to come out to LA and not know anything. Is this Tim from do all these crazy childhood? Things? I mean, how were you like financially as a kid? Like, yeah. So financially as a kid, I mean, we, my, I had the parents that were, uh, we didn't have a lot of money, but they, we never knew that. Like we never knew that money was even mm -hmm. a thing. You know, like we would take the yearly trip to Myrtle Beach, mm -hmm. we'd pack up the minivan and we'd drive on down. You know what I mean? And um, and we had you know a a bike when we needed a bike. You know, but they just did a good job at not like. It wasn't like we were worried about where our next meal was going to come from, but they just did a really good job of not us not worrying about it. But I knew that for anything outside of that, I had to hustle, and I was always drawn to the hustle not the job i never had a real job like i said i would go i learned how to film because i was filming my friend's skateboard so and then i bought a mac because i was editing skateboard videos so then i realized that there's not really money there in akron ohio but what i could do is i could go to it started with my little cousin's little league football game and i would go and i would sit there for the whole game and film 
the game. And then I would come back next week with DVDs of the game for the parents and say, hey, 20 bucks, you know, you can buy your, watch your kid, uh, whatever, run yeah. around the field and run into each other. And, uh, and little stuff like that is what I was always trying to do. So I've realized at 30 years old now, I just love the progress. Like I love the journey, learning the process. about something, starting something. Yeah, it's not it's not as tied to money as I thought it was. It's not traveling for me. That's not a thing yet. Yeah. Maybe it will be one day. It's like trying to start businesses or trying to start things <clears throat> and trying to put them out to the world and see how people react. Even the podcast, I make zero dollars off the podcast, and I have no plan to. But it's so cool to sit with these guests, try to figure out the best format. How can I really, you know, blah, blah, blah. What's the cover art look like? What's my mm. little set look like? And then put it out and I'm just sitting there hitting refresh, refresh, refresh and seeing <laughs> yeah. what the views are. You know, I just yeah. like that. Yeah. Right. And when I'm not doing that, that's when I start to go nuts. You do, know? Are you, do you hate boredom? Yeah, I do. I do. I'm okay. Uh, the reason why, I pa- I, why I'm hesitating is because I'm not one of those guys that always has to be around a lot of people or <clears> like <throat> always has to be doing something. Like mm-hmm. I can be at home, but... I have to be, you know, reading a new book or working on a new release plan for, you know, like I have to be doing something with a purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm really bad at like just chilling for the sake of chilling. You know, it's always been a a which feeds which feeds well into a clothing line because talk about how hard. That is. I mean, every week now the trend is changing. Like, yeah. how do you keep we up with that? We failed like five times already. Oh yeah, right. yeah. I've yeah. failed fifty. <laughs> and I've even went and tried to do other lines with other other people that were similar to what Young and Reckless was and failed. You yeah, know? talk yeah. about that. Talk yeah. about how hard that is. Yeah. So so it's it's insanely hard, especially now because, like you guys said, it changes so quick. And it used to be like you would design your collection a year early. You would pre-book it so you knew what people were going to buy. You would design in seasons, four of them a year. You would shoot your campaign. Let's say you want to go get like a celebrity or a brand ambassador. You shoot your campaign and that's your spring campaign and you are done. And I'm not to say it's not a lot of work, but it's it's a lot easier to schedule and to put into those spring, summer, formula. fall. Yeah. And, and now that is completely dead and if you are in any way working in seasons as far as i'm concerned in fashion you're losing mm-hmm. um explain isn't that. there like explain 20 that. seasons now I, uh, yeah there just isn't it's, like it's a, just like yes like people wear long so explain in the that though. that's a good point explain yeah. what you mean yeah. by that so what i mean is like i said that's the old way of doing it the new way is all that you know for a fact is people buy more long sleeve things in the winter and short sleeve things in the summer right there's your seasons that's yeah. It. Yeah. But, yeah. but what you do is you you know you say here is a run of okay uh Jeans are doing well for us. We tested with two different styles, really low quantities, but they performed really well. So now we're going to go design 15 different styles of denim, and we're going to order 20,000 units and bring those in ASAP. Now, on the flip side, um, these button-up shirts that we did aren't performing very well. So we're going to bail on those, try to get rid of them, either do like a flash sale or send it to an off-price place or something like that and make room for something new. Okay, looks like we just launched hoodies two weeks ago and they're crushing it we need five more styles of that type of hoodie looks like blah 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 looks like it's constantly that every single day now do you, you have to do you geek out on that do you enjoy that yeah i like it yeah. i like it it's, it's one of those love hate do you like that taylor or what when did you when did you start young and reckless what year was it it was uh 2009 2009 yeah so that's when streetwear was pop yeah so let me tell you this too like my model when i started Young and Reckless was this. I wanted to, I saw how cool streetwear was. It was mm-hmm. killing it at that time. What, what brands were influencing you at that Diamond, time? Diamond, The Hundreds, obviously Supreme, Crooks and Castles. Fairfax. I mean, all the Fairfax guys. Yeah, <laughs> I, I liked it, man. And I, I used to go get clothes from them when we were filming um, Robin Big. Like I was wearing a lot of Diamond and Rob yeah. started um, Rogue Status, which okay. turned into DTA, the shirt with all the guns yes. on it. Um, so, so here's what happened. I realized like... W- where I grew up in Ohio, you don't have access to anything cool um, and definitely not cool brands like that. And out here in L.A. and New York, people are waiting in line f- overnight to buy a $50 Gildan T-shirt, right? Like, what the hell is going on? Um, so my thought was, OK, what if I made a brand that had a strong message and felt connected to the customer but didn't have that pride issue. I sold in malls. I was at Tilly's. I was everywhere, right? Because at the time, it was at the tail end of like the action sports thing being really big. The best-selling shirt was like a Fox Racing t-shirt at PacSun. Um, 
And so I said, what if I give that kind of streetwear vibe, but to the malls? But that was like, that was looked at as like, the Dude, you're thing. just grazing over some brilliance no, right no, now. No, no, stop me then. Stop. You, you I are, like you're a... grazing over brilliance <laughs> yeah, right now me, because of the me. fact that you pay attention to that shit. So many people think they're just going to start up a t-shirt brand. And well, just I, think, I, oh, yeah. Well, I think it, it's so much of you just want to be cool, right? And yes. You can probably speak to that. With the streetwear guys. Yeah, well, yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah, that's where a lot of them got screwed. And I, and I like those guys, and this is no diss to them. But where a lot of them got screwed is they really started this thing as like, the homies started making some t-shirts and it became a thing. And then they start, then you start to become cool around all the other homies. And then you get your store on Fairfax. And now you have like purpose. Like your whole life is about just like, yeah, I'm the dude from the thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm the like, dude yeah. For, I'm and the all dude of a sudden you're thing. going to trade shows and like, you're all wearing oh, the same yeah. shit and you're being real tough. And like, we're ready to fight someone over our t-shirts. And, <laughs> and but the problem is like, t-shirt when, wars, yeah, t-shirt wars, meet me on Fairfax. <laughs> but, uh, but when it started to blow up and the actual category of streetwear became really popular, they weren't prepared. They were bad operators. They weren't prepared to blow up a business. And so a lot of them, a few of them tried, a few of them did really well and made a lot of money, but nobody's really still around still killing it from that sort of phase it kind of it blew up a lot of them made a lot of money and now you don't really hear about a lot of them anymore and like i said i love those guys to death and they were a lot of my inspiration for starting young and reckless but they weren't ready for to operate a business on that level and sell to those type of stores and deal with returns and all the shit that happened so so purely operational mistakes like a business mistakes yeah and it just proves to you like brand is so important and brand is like it's everything, man. But if you can't back it up with a plan and a distribution plan and an operational, you know, like you, you're not running a sound business. It, it's gonna, you're gonna hit a wall, mm -hmm. you know. But I think that's why a lot of there's always kind of the big handoff, right? A lot of companies start and explode, and then they usually sell or take on money. And at that point, when that happens, that's when you're getting the operations, right? That's when those people are coming in and saying, okay, here's how we actually scale this business. It's really rare that any business has blown up to its full potential with the original founders, you know, but I think in streetwear, it's just a little easier to spot because the founders look like skater kids. You know what I mean? Like you can spot mm -hmm. them. Um, you're not welcome on Fairfax with a suit and a Goldman Sachs briefcase. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so what I was getting at is um, that was the goal. I said, man, I can do this. Like I can make a streetwear brand. Uh, I always used to joke streetwear with no pride, right? Streetwear, but I, I'll sell it anywhere. I'll sell it anywhere. Who like, cares? Like, the hell do I care? We're all young and reckless, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's what we did. And we went Your to Your mom's Pakistan. young and reckless. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I always used to tell that story too. My mom called me one day. I was like, Christopher, I just want to let you know I'm, I'm young and reckless today. Yeah. I'm young and reckless And today. I was like, why, mom? What happened? And she's like, well, my recipe for cookies said to put uh, one teaspoon in, but I put three. <laughs> and I'm like, mom, you killed it. Like, you're, yeah. you're living the brand. Doing mom, it. Thanks so much. Doing it hard uh, yeah. So anyway, so we did that. We got a lot of backlash for that. A lot of people, um, oh, especially sure. the Fairfax guys, hated us for that. You know, it was just like you're just this whack. Like you're selling thing. out, right? Yep. And sure enough, uh, a lot of them sold to the malls right after we did. Uh, like, <laughs> well, they are making some money over there. Um, so, uh, so that happened. I guess what I'm getting at is, shit. I'm rambling. What I'm getting at is. Um, that business model is now gone because of e -com. So mm. you can order Supreme anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter if you're in Akron, Ohio. It doesn't matter who you are. Totally like it, changed the game. It, right. Yeah, it used to be this elite thing. You could they wouldn't even it wasn't even a good vibe when you went in their stores. They didn't want you Supreme. in there. They only wanted the cool <laughs> guys in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Who were the first to pivot? You know, once that changed. Well, pivot how to e -com, You're saying. Yeah. Yeah. The first? I don't know who was the first. I, well, what do you think about the way that, that it's evolved and like what you would consider streetwear today? Yeah, because I guess, brands? so So, so what I'm, the point too that I'm trying to make is like, so now that's gone, right? So me being a streetwear brand selling to the malls is not even, that doesn't even sound cool. Any, that doesn't sound interesting because it's not a thing. Because first of all, all malls are closing. And second of all, you can get streetwear at malls now. So the new thing is, also in that time, H&M, Topshop, Uniqlo, all those places came here and expanded. Since Young and Reckless has started, they weren't really here when Young and Reckless started. Mm. So now you can get a full outfit that looks just like your favorite rapper, athlete, celebrity for 30 bucks. You can get the whole thing, right? I can't oh, compete with that. Like <laughs> right. I don't have, there's nothing I can do with those prices. So my goal now is how do I, our main focus is e-com, how do you, sell a full collection as affordable as humanly possible, but attach a strong brand. And, and, and I'm gonna ask you, the kid, to pay 15% more to buy Young and Reckless jeans than H&M jeans, but, but you, you have the Young and Reckless 
tag and you have the brand and we're also going to curate music and artists and we're going to give you this lifestyle i think that's that's something i can accomplish what are the strategies that you're, you're putting in place to do that it's really number one the hardest part is just sourcing the product like we're making pro- we're doing jeans two for 70 bucks and we're doing two for uh two for 30 printed tees and packs of three t-shirts for 20 bucks we're we're, we're doing really really well on prices but that's a mission to try to figure that out and to keep your quality right, right right so what you do is we're we're trying to nail that as much as we can and then we're really trying to kind of also elevate the marketing and make it look even more expensive and make sure that we work even more with people that we really believe in and make sure that the quantity of content is there because now you put it out today and it's completely they forget about it tomorrow right like we could have barack obama wearing a young and reckless t-shirt today and by monday it would never happen you know what i'm saying it used to be like 50 cent war echo on trl and the brand blew up up, you know but those days are just gone so it's quantity it's like what's our brand message what's our values pump that out as much as we can, make it feel elevated, and then sell the clothing for an affordable price. I think if you do all that, you create a world that's like, ah, oh, this is something of value. Dude, that know? was a great trip down memory lane right there. TRL. Yes, I'm telling <laughs> you. It days, used huh? to be. Like, if you hear those stories, it's like, yeah, the moment he wore it on blah, 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 was, it just yeah. exploded, you know, mm. but now, like, nobody cares. How do you feel about, you know, the days of Amazon now? That, that being the big juggernaut. Uh, it's like half of me thinks it's so amazing and so cool and I love everything they're doing and half of, half of me is scared for my life because, uh, you know, it's, I am in a business right. that, uh, that they could just steamroll to a degree. You know what I mean? Um, I, I think they're doing everything so well. They do such a good job on everything they do. Um, I'm curious to see how branded apparel fits in Mm-hmm. to what they're it's doing. It's going to be very interesting. It's interesting. Because it seems like br- like brands, for a lot of things, don't matter anymore because now you want to look and see, oh, this has got five-star rating, this has got five-star rating, that's all I care about. But clothes yep. are a little bit different, right? Clothes yeah. have style and fashion. Yep. So they seem to be a little bit protected from that. But also, here's one of my theories, is I believe that, um, okay, so let's put ourselves in a make-believe um, high school. And when we were all in high school, you would walk down the hallway and you would see the kids, the Hot Topic kids and the FUBU kids Mm -hmm. and that, right? And that is how you said who you were and Mm. what type of person you were. And that's Mm -hmm. why you would pay $40, $30 for a screen printed t-shirt, right? It's the value is not there. Mm -hmm. It's the brand, right? Now, when you walk through a school, what says who you are is what's on your Snapchat. Yeah. And what do you have the iPhone X? And the iPhone X is a thousand dollars. It's an accessory. Really nice outfit. It's a very high school. Well, technically, Apple's a luxury brand. That's what they say. 100%. And and what's your, do you have the Apple Watch? What's your phone case? What's on your uh, Snapchat? What are your SoundCloud playlists? Mm -hmm. That is what says who you are. So if you have now, then you go stack it with some H&M jeans or some affordable stuff because it doesn't Hmm. even really matter as much anymore. Um, that's how you kind of put together your life now and express yourself. So just brands don't mean as much in apparel either mm. um, unless you're actually providing real value. And I think that value is not only through the clothing and the quality and the price, but also what are you giving that kid? Are you telling them what music to listen to? Are you telling them mm-hmm. what podcasts are cool? Are you actually, you know, they'll subscribe the to The whole you. brand. Yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll tap into you. If mm. you're actually giving them something of value, you mm-hmm. know, but if you just say like, we're the coolest because... We just are. Look, look at you us. Said so. you know, yeah. like, was that part of your motivation to do the podcast? Hundred percent. So two big motivations because we covered them both. One was that was how can I offer something? And the thing that I'm so passionate about is I moved to LA. I got out of my comfort zone and I was exposed to what's possible. That's it. Like I saw, I, I watched an MTV show be created. I watched people become superstars. I watched brands be created. I watched DC shoes go from. One million dollars in revenue to five hundred million after the Robin Big explosion. I watched it. Yeah. That was the greatest gift. So what I try to do is let other people see it. Just interview people, humanize them, say this is how they did it. It's not that big of a deal. They've right. had their hard times too. They've had their good times. This, their idea came to them in the shower, or this one came when they were hiking. Mm-hmm. Like here's the reality: you can do that too. So it was that mixed with wanting to continue to tell who I am and get at you know. Uh, just tell my story and 
why do you, once again, why do you follow me on Instagram? If it's just because I have cool pictures and because I'm the guy from the clothing thing, it's not going to work. I'm not going to build an audience right. that way. If you follow me because I'm a young entrepreneur that is around other young entrepreneurs and I expose you to cool ideas and cool strategies that I'm trying and books that I'm reading. And mm. by the way, here's our new collection and here's how we made it. That's some value. Right. You know? And you wouldn't so. know this unless you listen to you like I'm listening to you right now talking. Yeah. You know, I mean. That's the thing. And also, you know, like once again, the gift and the curse is most people that do know who I am that don't like subscribe to what I'm doing now think the opposite. Like they just think like, I don't know, he's the fucking guy from the thing. Like he was mm -hmm. on the show and mm -hmm. then I think he had like a clothing thing or young and restless, like the soap opera. Or, I don't know. You know, but like <laughs> it, young and the restless. <laughs> Dude, please tell I me you've you had that. Please so many tell times. me you've had that oh. before. Oh my God. Not Shit. only have I had it, but one day we were filming on the set of The Bold and the Beautiful because it was Rob's <laughs> mom's favorite thing. And they asked me to take my hat off because the young and restless set was next door. <laughs> oh, I'm like, damn, I feel like it's like offended. enemy like gang yeah. territory. Oh, yeah. you know? oh, like, yeah. yo, can you please take that off? And I'm like, it's not the same. They're like, please. Yeah, you're gonna start a war. Oh, that's Hilarious. Yeah, there's no Y and R in the building. Oh, you yeah. know? <laughs> Fabio's gonna come out. Hey, motherfucker! Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Good I just, you. I just noticed that. Like, I love doing the TV stuff and having fun and getting shot out of cannons and attacked by bulls. I really do. But there's a different type of sort of fulfillment that I get when I'm sitting talking to young entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. or I'm talking about mindset habits, or I'm talking about daily routine, like just stuff that I really like and apply every day. Right. So. I want to pursue that as much as I can and share that information. And, you know, the same thing that everyone wants. I want a kid to come up to me one day and say, like, I truly lived a life that I didn't think I'd be able to because of you, because right. you exposed me to that. Because that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. you know? Does it feel like a bigger purpose than everything else? In other words, do you feel like this is just a bigger purpose than... Yeah, I think that it is a purpose. I don't think the other stuff <laughs> was a purpose. Like, that was part of the problem, right? And I hope that doesn't get taken the wrong way, but um, it's fun filming a show and and I made okay money um, and even launching the brand was cool but that's not a that's, I didn't have a talent I wasn't famous for a talent I wasn't famous because people liked my music I wasn't even that funny I fit into the dynamic well that's what I was mm. good at if I had a gift on Fantasy Factory Robin Big it was knowing where the hole was for me and filling it right yeah. um, but so people aren't coming up to you saying man that song like helped me through a tough time that, you know like it's like <laughs> My dude, like, who's who shit in the pool? Who's shit in the pool? You know, like, oh, like, fuck. Um, so, oh, no. um, so, yeah, it wasn't, I think I was kind of searching for a little bit of that purpose. And I mm. think that it then led me to starting Young and Reckless and then led me to realize that I loved entrepreneurship and I loved that. And so now, talking to other entrepreneurs, trying to teach people how to achieve, trying to teach people that they can get out of their comfort zones and they can do some stuff that they really don't think that they can do, um, that is my purpose. You know, we hear a lot about your generation and the younger generation, the millennials, if you will. Uh, there's a lot of shit talk about them, but I see, I see like this huge explosion of like entrepreneurship. Yeah, creativity. Is, is that is that am purpose. I am I just be am I crazy or is that legit? Because I see a lot of kids, you know, in their mid twenties and early thirties, and they want to They're into the hustle of it. Yeah, it's yeah. it's different than when I was a kid. It wasn't the same. It's definitely a debate to be had. I don't know yet. I think that I I'm on the tail end, right? Like I'm like millennial cusp. Yeah. Right? Millennial adjacent. Um, yeah. because like I didn't grow up like pointing a phone at my face and telling people what I'm doing still feels really oh. stupid. Oh good, we're all on the same page. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank God, God it feels still like I could, I could do this I was I could do this all inside. day long right yeah. here or stand in front of tons of people, but to talk to the phone still know, is oh, it's too weird. God. Man. So I um yeah, so I don't I didn't get that. I'm forcing myself anytime I'm doing stuff like that. Um but I did come with a little bit of the I think um, you know, the fact that you even can like we always joke about if you dropped out of college 10 years ago and said, I'm going to go start a business, they'd be like, well, we'll see you on Skid Row. You know what I mean? But now if you do it, they'd be like, hell yeah, you are. Yeah. That's going to be awesome. You're going to be just like Gary Vee. You know what I mean? Like, like it's it's totally. accepted now. Now, I think that the bad thing that comes from that is everybody thinks they can do it. Everyone thinks they don't they realize can do how, hard, it. how much hard work is involved. No, and, and it's more about like, do you look like you're doing it right. better God, than what you're good, actually ooh, doing God, it? God, what a good point. Right? Like, people get really good at looking like they're getting really good yes. and I think that that is a problem that's becoming a skill thank you Instagram yeah thank you man for <laughs> screwing up our youth uh, <laughs> but uh, no I think that that's really dangerous so if I could make my stance in the debate I would say I think there will be more entrepreneurs and self-made people because of it because just of simply more people trying like it's getting marketed almost 
Yeah, you're going to have more. If you, you know, let's just say you had a thousand people try before. If you have ten thousand try more, you, or try this year, you're going to have double mm-hmm. the success At rate. Least. But I think you're going to have a lot of people really confused and right. really yeah. lost. Like, why isn't really, this working? Yeah, like yeah. what? I'm doing everything right. My post got a thousand mm. likes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like what? What's taking so long? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I think that it's you know I think it's dangerous. Mm. Like, you know, but. I want it, my goal is to try to find a way to like, um, and I haven't been doing a very good job of it yet, but to try to give like real realness, not all the fluff, you know, and the like, I don't know. There's a lot of just fluff entrepreneur talk Fuck out there. Fuck yeah, there is. Of course. And to try to really say like, this is how you do it. Or like, I'm doing a campaign with 21 Savage and here's what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, why I'm hoping that it will work oh, well. That's cool. Like I'm trying to do more of that um, without coming off too harsh because sometimes I listen to myself and I'm like you sound like like a drill instructor like you know what I mean like get out there and you gotta find out how many units and like nobody cares about that <laughs> uh, so finding that sweet spot I think yeah is but important. that was the brilliance that I was talking about I mean you do your homework it's not like you just <laughs> thought yeah. of a cool I think most kids think build a cool page make myself look cool get a good camera they're yep. thinking of all and those brand things. is just the logo yeah, right that's wow. where it stops I think yeah. they don't like yeah. the process Right. Going back to what you oh, mentioned. Oh, yeah. No, right. yeah. They, but they, they don't even know that they like it or don't like it because they've never even tried it. Like, it's like, I always, I use this comparison for everything, but it's the same thing as going to the gym and being in shape, right? It's like, nobody likes it. Nobody <laughs> actually is like, yes, this 10 more. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't wait. One, two. You know, like, it doesn't uh, happen, but you don't realize how how nice it is and how it's an added benefit to your existence when you learn to to. Mm-hmm. enjoy that suffer you oh, know what yeah. i'm saying and oh, i think yeah. that that's the same as how i look at like running a business like i don't there's a lot of days where i'm like holy are you kidding me this is like <laughs> this is what i have to do or like this it's terrible but when you go home at night on those days you feel extra good. so accomplished it's the day when i come in here when everything's just on autopilot and i'm just kind of walking around making sure everyone's good i go home and want to punch myself in the face like those are the bad days right you know and i just think a lot of young people a lot of people i don't think it's even I think this is a thing that has repeated itself for a very mm-hmm. long time. I think people have not gave it an honest try to know whether it's for you I or think, not. I think one of the biggest lies is that, you know, you need to be motivated. Like, I need to be motivated and pumped up to do things. And what people don't realize is that motivation, like any emotion, is an emotion. You get it, and it goes away, and then going. what? Mm-hmm. It's the when you're not motivated that you can become that you become successful. And one thing that I'm real big on too is motivation follows action. Action doesn't follow motivation, right? So like what I've learned is I don't sit and wait. It's like, well, not feeling it today. <laughs> and you know what? I'm not feeling it today either. Well, wait till I get inspired. Like you go, go do something. Go start. You know, come to the office, work on something, and you'll find the thing. Or and is it like create create going. motion will create emotion? Is that what it goes? Yeah, motion there? creates emo- or motion motion creates emotion. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think that there's emotion sales. in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. so, that's what I know. Yeah. I know that one too. Uh, so yeah, I just think there's a lot of people that are kind of spending their whole lives sitting, waiting for that strike of motivation to hit them, and you, they just don't realize that it comes from like messing up and feeling stupid and feeling awkward mm-hmm. and losing, and you know. Now, outside of you, obviously your the field you work in and your podcast, like, or, is there anything else that sparks your interest or things that you're into? Little stuff. You know, I like photography still. Like it's lingering from my days of filming and and taking photos as a skater. I like it, but I just don't. Like I'm not out walking through the park taking photos of trees. Like I just can't. I don't Mm -hmm. know where. Maybe if I go on good vacations one day. Um, No, man. I I hate to sound so. uh, You're passionate about what you do. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Very, very consuming when you're into what you do, man. Yeah, no. I just yeah. I like reading books and stuff, but all the books I'm reading are like entrepreneurial. So like, I yeah. got to get out of that. I got to read some more like history stuff or something else <laughs> interesting. But um, yeah, I, I'm pretty I'm pretty focused on on what I do. And, and other than that, I who are your favorite entrepreneurs? Oh man, that's a tough one. I would say you know the list that's coming to mind is the obvious. It's the Elon Musk, mm. the uh, you know Steve Jobs. He was an asshole, but what he created was, mm, you know, I don't brilliant. like his personality, but what he created was brilliant. Um, Jeff Bezos, you know, all the go-to. I don't have, <laughs> have some you, have good, you read like, the four? Niche. Have you read the four yet? The what? The four. No. Oh, bro. What's well, see, the four? The four is about the big four companies. Is it those guys? Yeah. Well, it's a book. It's yeah. It's their yeah. It's their game plan. I want to write it. Exactly. Like the Four Horsemen, dude. You mm-hmm. will. It's my favorite book I've read all year. I'm writing it down. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if I have any like 
really cool niche one that well, Rob's got to be in there. Well, of course he is. He is. But right. I, um, he's like my brother. You know, like I, right. I'm a fan of him as a whole. Like I don't even think of him as like the right. great entre- entrepreneur. Right. He's like, yeah, he's he's, <laughs> he's my brother. That's awesome. Any uh, favorite guests you've had on your show so far? Uh, our mutual friend Tom, Tom Billu, mm. yeah. uh, is amazing. Um, I I interviewed Tim Ferriss, who's on this coming week's episode. Okay, uh, he was great. He was like. So so was he cr- different than you had expected, or was he exactly? Uh, he was different. You want to know what? I once again, just being honest. Sometimes on his podcast, I feel like he comes off a little arrogant, mm. and I just think it's his. I just now that I've met him, I think it's just his how his personality sort of comes off. He was the nicest guy, and he came here by himself, and it was at eight thirty in the morning on a Sunday because that's he could squeeze it in before he left town, and he just came with two big duffel bags and he had been out of town for like the last five weeks but everything he needed was in these two duffel bags including his whole podcast recording setup like he just lives he is tim ferris like yeah. there's not a piece of him that is not who he says he mm-hmm. is um, but it just i think this the big thing to me was he was so so nice and so willing to just sit for hours and talk about anything i feel like we're surprised more than we actually are right on most time when we have a guest we think they're going to be huh he might be boring and it's like so true right yeah. don't you feel like that i feel like it, that's what i love about this well the yeah. thing about podcasting that we've noticed and realized is that podcasters it's like this it still is and i'm sure it's going to change because everybody's getting into podcasting now but it seems like this this great community. Like everybody kind of wants to help each other yep. grow and They're do well. Yep. We when we first started, we were nobodies, and we would meet these big podcasters, and they were totally helpful. Like they'd want us to succeed and come on my show, and I'll be on your show. And yeah. it was like, well, this my is, house, you know, yeah. that kind of yeah. no You're shit. Like, yeah. like yeah. seriously, it yeah. was it's pretty awesome. It's so cool, and I will say that that was one thing that I hated about. Um, about the streetwear. I was going to say apparel is like the opposite. It's the opposite. Apparel is like fitness for us. Oh. Yeah. Just a lot of territorial. Oh, yeah. A lot of insecure. Yeah. Camps. You're in that camp. Oh, you're that. Okay, that's what you wear. That's it's a battle so of modality. That's how fit, bro, yeah. fitness is just like that. It is so stupid. That's kind of yeah. what, that's what inspired Mind Pump was to break that mold. So the three of us have, taught, we've been in 15, 20 years, but we all have different backgrounds and we share the, the, the positive things about all the different modalities of training. Yep. But within our community, it's not like that. It's like my way is better than your way. And it's like who's dropping studies to prove that what, the way what we're doing is better than what they're doing over there. And it's yep. like, no, there's something. Just to- it's insecurities. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of insecurities. A lot of big egos and fragile egos. And But in podcasting, we haven't seen that. Really haven't. Everybody's yeah. been super fucking cool it's- and smart. It's so weird. Everybody's pretty yeah, smart. Yeah, that's the cool thing. Yeah. There's not too many like complete idiots. No. Um, I, and if so, they're really funny. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they got that working. going for them. Um, but it's just weird how an entire industry can, like the culture can be insecure. You know, like it's, because that, that's how clothing is. Like they will fight, people will fight each other over like clothing shit. Dude, like it's so. That's exactly stupid. how fitness is. Yeah. Like the last big fitness convention down here in LA, there was. It was uh, a fist fight, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, yeah, what's yeah, his face yeah. who just died, right? Oh, was, uh, oh, 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 oh. Rich, Rich Piana. Piana. Yeah, it was the big. I don't know if you know who that is, but no. uh, big tattooed dude. Uh, he just died recently, but just the last big LA convention Shocking. for fitness. They got into a big old brawl, and it's like these camps, you know, and they they sell their clothes and their supplements. And it's like I just think, I think it's image. I think any type of image industry that's super. You know, based on image and how you look, yeah. it, a lot of that's driven by, I think, insecurity, like fitness, right? Like, I was the skinny kid, so I want to build all this muscle. Or I was really fat, so I need, I need to look a particular way. So these big egos, real fragile egos. And in podcasting, it's really just, it's about your content. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's about your value. Most everybody that listens are growth-minded people, right? It's going deeper, deeper, yeah. Most, most people that turned on a podcast, you turned on the first time to probably listen and learn yeah. something, right? Yeah. Were you a big podcast listener before you started? You know, not like crazy like i was um but like joe rogan the occasional tim ferris kind of the obvious mm-hmm. go-tos mm-hmm. i more just loved the the platform like i just thought it was so cool i'm more i i believe that i i gravitate a little bit more to talking than to like on camera stuff yeah. if i could mm-hmm. have it my way right um and just the fact that you could do whatever you want, I could launch it tomorrow. You know, it just super was, free. Yeah, I really, really medium. like that. I could do it in the office. I and the way I always looked at it, and still look at it, is like I think that it's the, it's the foundation, or it's the thing that will start to kickstart all of my new things. Um, it's not the thing. Like right. I don't look at like I'm gonna have the world's biggest podcast. Mm-hmm. I just it's part so of it. Hard. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's just that's starting. I can't believe 
the conversations that I've had, and even, you know, like I wouldn't be talking to you guys if I didn't start a podcast, right? Because right? it went through Tom to then to whatever. Right. So imagine talking to Tom. Now I'll call Tom with like weird brain questions, right? Because he's just like <laughs> brain genius. Yeah. Um, and I have 10 to 15 people that I now talk to regular on the regular um, because of sitting down and having right. these conversations with them. And mm-hmm. It's just taking me in this whole kind of different direction that I didn't expect, um, which is really cool mm. you yeah. know and, and i just i think that'll be the start of kind of where my life goes have you always been this self-aware and growth-minded because you're very um i i know you mostly from the show from mm-hmm. you know robin big and hearing you talk and whatever you're extremely intelligent very self-aware and very growth-minded Has, have you always been that way or is this something that you started to develop did you have a pivotal moment in your life no uh first of all thank you because that was an insanely nice compliment <laughs> i i think that um if, if i could really I think when I was younger, it came off more as like anxiety and like worry, and you know what I mean. I think that, that was like the young. Same here. Yeah, yeah. and I and I it's still I, something. I know what I mean. Yeah, it's still my biggest. If I could say like what's like what's your biggest flaw? It's that. Like it's just anxiety and sort of social. Like that's why the podcast has been great for me too because it forces me to sit mm-hmm. down and talk to someone for at least an Super hour. Super therapeutic. Oh my God. So yeah. therapeutic. And when, right? like, there's been days when I, especially in the beginning, when I would come in and be like, "Oh man, I don't know what to talk about. I don't know his story really well. Like, where are we gonna go?" And then I will leave and be like, "Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> talk for two hours. Yeah. I overcame. <laughs> you killed that conversation." Uh, you know, and like it really is like putting yourself through like this thing. But um, no, I think that. Yeah, I think that I was an overthinker, and still am, but I think that, um, yeah, there was no big turning point or anything like that. I've always been pretty, like, analytical mm. and just really tried to look at everything as thorough as possible. And like I said, it's not always St- studies. Do you, studies show, like what you're saying, is actually, if studies will show that anxiety and those types of things are definitely closely connected to growth-minded individuals it's almost like it forces people to try to grow and yeah. you know change and whatever yeah because you're in this uncomfortable state you know most of the time yeah and i think like the good thing is you're really self-aware like being self-aware is really good when you're doing a podcast but when you're in an uncomfortable situation it's really bad yeah, yeah because you're like over- I'm, I'm over- stupid. Yeah. i look stupid you're doing stupid i things. said that oh my Why god i said that, that? Why are you, yeah. they think you're the guy from the okay we <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, so uh yeah. yeah it's not always it's not always a gift do you well? Are there? Th- do you have exercises that you do to help you with that, or do you you catch yourself and what do you kegels. do? Kegels. <laughs> yeah. So it's that kegels when I'm in usually crowded situations. <laughs> squeeze it up real tight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that um, in the last like two years, I have been on kind of this mission to like, you know, just be a little bit better, more well-rounded person. Figure out where my f- issues are, my f- my flaws are, and just really work on them. You know, even if it's socially, even if it's not spending enough time with my friends or like I added it on my notes every single day to call or text my mom. Um, and I just noticed now it's a habit and every morning I say, hey mom, love you, hope you have a great day. And there would be like two week times when I didn't talk to my mom at all. Not for any reason, not because we have an issue because I don't love her. I just wouldn't think about it mm-hmm. and she wouldn't say anything. So it's little stuff like that that I'm really trying to slowly get better. I think that when it comes to the anxiety and stuff, um, the main thing, like meditation has really helped a lot. Yeah. Mm. Uh, How often do you do it? Every day really? if I'm doing it right. Do you I mean, use any like tools for it or just sit on your own quiet? I, I use a Calm on the app, Calm. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Yep, so it's for 10 minutes. So I do that. I, I even recently started doing uh, affirmations and goals because uh, one of the guys I had on my podcast who became a really good friend is really big on that. So I was like, fuck it, I'll try it. So I recorded it on my, of me saying it. Um, on my mics into put it on my iPhone so every morning I sit for 10 minutes and I do meditation and then I listen to my little affirmations and I listen to my goals for the end of 2018 where I'll be December 2018 Um, and it's amazing how some of those little things really just snowball into making yourself you just feel a little bit more in control and grounded and there are times when I'll be in situations and start to get a little jammed up and and I'll focus on my breathing or stuff mm-hmm, like that mm-hmm. but i haven't found a cure all i think that it's like it's a practice as you get better everything gets better right, you know right. and that's an, that'll forever be a challenge to try how, to figure how do you out. deal i just another good book for you irresistible uh talks about um like the addiction to phones and social media yes. and this is a big part of all of our lives and world now and 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 for sure a tool for us to be successful but it also can consume you Mm -hmm. uh do you notice that yourself and do you are there you uh do anything to make sure you have like a day off or you get away from that like what's that like for you yeah 100 percent. i think it's 
I think it's terrible. And I, um, what I did for a long time, and I think I'm going to go back to it, is I had two phones. And one phone was only phone and text, and the other one was everything else. So YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, mm. email, everything was on another phone. So you are very, very aware. Like right now, it would be in my bag. Oh. And I would have a moment where I, like, we we're done, and like, okay, I have a break, I have nothing. I get to check my stuff, right? Mm. But then you put it back, and you're just very aware of when you're messing around and wasting time. And when you're not, it's so easy to check a real email that's that means something and then go over to Instagram for a second. And then you go blah, blah, blah. And before mm-hmm. you know it, it was 20 minutes and right. you checked an email, you know? Right. Um, and I think that it's, I think it's really bad. And I think it's a problem that I have 100%. I need to check it. Like I need to whatever. I have an app on my phone called Moment, which um, you set like a goal of, like I try to stay under four hours, which sounds insane, on my phone every day. And it alerts you when you're that over. That book talks about that app. Does it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I got that from, I think, a podcast or a book or something. Um, so it's great. It sends you a little alert. Hey, you're a loser when you go <laughs> four hours. Hey, um, junkie. Why don't yeah. you stop? Like, yeah. Hey, crackhead. Uh, yeah. How's Instagram? <laughs> um, and then, and it tells you what apps you spend time on, which is mind blowing. If you even go, I didn't know this for a long time. If you go to your, I believe, settings, go to battery, and then go to click usage, it'll show you what percentage of your battery was spent on what apps. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah, so it'll say like 75% Instagram for a day. Oh, and you'll be like, shit. Shit. Well, I'm a loser. Shit. I did yeah. not know that. That's yeah. a little hack right there. I had yeah. no idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so it tells you that and and whatever. But um, yeah, it's another thing that you just have to try. It's just like anything, man. I'm learning that like, it may sound like yeah, no shit, but like, all of these things. You know what the issue is. You know how to do it better. Like you know how to eat better. You know how to exercise a little bit more. You know how to stay off your phone a little bit more. You know how to like. It's just doing it. Yeah. And doing it little by little and trying to set up systems to track if you did it or not um, really helps. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I have I, this thing that I that I do, which is a combination of like from Jerry Seinfeld and a friend of mine and blah, 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 all this different stuff um, where every day that's what I was talking about with my mom. Every day I have like eight things. So I have my notes every day that are printed out with what I have to do that day. At the top of that every day is all of the things that I should do for like a basic successful day, meaning drink two liters of water, call or text my mom, stretch, meditate, like the basics. Right. Um, and I cross them off as I go throughout my day. And then if I get them, if I cross them all, I have a calendar at home on my wall that I put a giant red X on with a Sharpie for that day. Because what happens is if you get three X's, and number one, you're tracking it. So you know mm. what you're doing. You know if you're doing good or bad. That alone makes a huge impact sure. than saying, I don't I feel it's like awareness. I'm yeah, you're good aware. this week. You yeah, know? Yeah. You're forced to be aware. Yes. And then what happens is you might have a long day. You might have not done very well. But you get home and you see three X's in the last three days on those on that calendar. And you know that today you're not going to get one. You'll do the extra stuff. Mm. Like you'll be like, oh, whatever. I'm just going to chug the water and call right. my mom. Keep, like, keep the street going. Yeah, you keep the street going. And you notice too, like... You know, you have a big night of drinking or you have some whatever thing and you have like four blank days and then you kind of get it back together and you get a chain going and then something happens and you start to learn what gets you off and what keeps you on and what, you know, and just being able to track that on the most basic form with a Sharpie and some paper really, really helps. Yeah. Which one of those basics is the most challenging for you to get consistently? It's. It's for some reason. I'm just, for some reason, it's the water. Drinking two <laughs> liters of water. I don't know why. I just every like literally every day. It's almost. Uh, it's almost always the thing on there because it's. I think maybe because it's throughout the whole day. Like you're, you'll get home and be like, I have to drink a liter and a half of water, and I really don't feel like it. Yeah, you know, of and like you have to because the other ones like read, and it's kind of these things that you can do. At least you're knocking off the real important ones. I feel like. Yeah, <laughs> but still, that's such a stupid thing to not be doing. You know what I mean? Like I find myself now, like the last week, I've been like. Okay, drink the water. Drink like you're in the Uber. Drink the water. You're in, like you know what I mean. And yeah. just it's stupid. But other than that, what are so, what are what are your biggest challenges with business right now? Biggest challenges, I think, is just amount of content needed. Ah, oh, God, ain't the truth. You know, mm-hmm. as a whole, we're in a content war right now. I feel like, yeah. Is, is that why you started the vlog? Yeah, and I'm doing a terrible job at it. You know, like I should be. I I should be. There's no reason why I am not posting a vlog every day. And a podcast and a blah, blah. I mean, there's just no reason. It's what you should be doing, but it's so hard. And once again, walking around pointing a camera at your face all day is so stupid. And when you're trying to just, I don't know, I just, the way my brain works, 
it just feels so show offy to me. Yeah, like, so vain. I feel and you. So and it's just like, ugh, I it, it was so it. hard to get on Instagram. It was so this guy was like hammering on me get on Instagram, <laughs> and I'm looking through and I'm like, like, let's go, Grandpa. This I'm is like, how yeah. we're going to build this fucking <laughs> business, bro. Yeah. I'm like, this is narcissism. None of the kids hell. are going to listen to yeah, us if you don't get on fucking in. Instagram. Yeah, shit, I mean, yeah. fitness on Instagram is just a pile of shit. It's yep. fucking narcissism hell, and was so difficult to get on. But so true. Yeah. It's a tool. It's a business tool. You got to use it and get over that. You know, it's even just, these guys will be like you have to post more photos of yourself like, <laughs> yeah. stop posting like doing a podcast today you know like <laughs> not, don't look at me uh and i'm like it's so stupid like, the, like what's my ca-? then you have to worry about your caption what's your caption like <laughs> yeah, yeah get out there it today yeah. just kill it <laughs> look at me in this chair with yeah. a headset on like you can do it too um so i don't know i just naturally shy away from it but yes it's just across the board like you have to be communicating every mm-hmm. day of mm-hmm. with something of good quality and something of good value and it's like how the hell so i got to do that from my thing young and reckless has to be doing that and it's hard that's definitely the biggest challenge yeah more than ever the brand means the person behind it more than ever it wasn't like that before it's it but now not. it's it's all you it's like if you're if they know you and they like you your brand will do well it's that's so it. true and i always said it like um when i first started young and reckless me being on a reality show i thought was a was a detriment it was not good because mm-hmm. These brands at the time were like, they were mysterious and they had this cool factor. And it was like, oh, I think this guy owns it. And I heard mm-hmm. he has seven Ferraris. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's like, this guy over here. Oh, this guy, so are I, you mysterious? Yeah, no. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I have to tell you a story. <laughs> so, so Taylor, the only you reason Taylor's the most sitting him. in on this podcast <laughs> yeah, today. Time, so huh? truth be told, so Taylor doesn't even podcast with us. He actually runs our whole social media side. Nice. But I said, dude, you got to be on this podcast with Chris because I know that this guy, how we met, he was only 23 years old, so this is fucking 10 years ago. Yeah, and we're playing basketball together. I'm so I'm fascinated by this kid that he has the ability to come in the gym at 11 and three, and I'm like, what the fuck is this kid doing? Uh-huh. Nice shoes on, dressed nice, dressed in court. What are you doing? He's like, oh, I have a Facebook business. At this time, this is 10 years ago. Is, it was Twitter. It was oh, Twitter. Oh, it was Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what? Yeah, so he's got a social media business, yeah. and at this time. I've heard of people that have made money that way, but I never met anybody yet. Yeah. And I, here's this twenty-something-year-old kid, and I'm I'm super fascinated by it. I'm like, dude, we gotta have lunch. Like you've you've created like a six-figure business off of a fucking Twitter. Yeah, like, yeah. come on, I got I gotta yeah. have lunch with this I'm kid. I'm still fascinated. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. So I, we have lunch and. Uh, we talk all about it, and he basically kind of shows me the ropes, and that's actually when I turned my Instagram on. But he created uh, an apparel uh, company, and I I'm teasing him because, you know, he doesn't. There's no images of him all the time. He's Mister Undercover. So yeah, he see. <laughs> do people think you're like really cool? Well, I don't do it anymore. I re- <laughs> not that I re- you're not. I re- <laughs> <laughs> Just sure think that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, yeah. but you you build up this image, and, and in streetwear particularly, it's all about how cool do you look or yeah. how cool do you appear to be yeah. right and it's all about perception yeah perception is everything and when i started meeting more and more people in the streetwear world when i started hanging out on fairfax more and going to the nike air mag events and you start meeting all these people you're like oh this is all fake yeah like, <laughs> like they're, they're, they're they're renting these cars <laughs> yeah. they're living with their parents i'm over here like i have my own spot and i'm like re- i'm like really trying to do it yeah you know? i'm really trying to live it yeah. and and then you you get you get exposed to it and you're like Everything you thought it was supposed to be yep. is not. Yep, one hundred percent. And and I just think like, you know, I guess w- what I was getting at is I thought so. It was kind of in the day where that those were the guys that were killing it, right? Where the mysterious, uh, sometimes fake life, just baller, <laughs> right? And so me being like, hey, it's me, drama from Fancy Factory. Like, you know, like that's not. <laughs> it wasn't good, you know. So I tried, uh, I tried as much as I could to actually sort of. Ch- be in the background you know i mean obviously people are going to know i own it i have to post about it and stuff because mm-hmm. i have all these followers but like i i did uh, marketing campaigns with meek mill and machine gun kelly in the early days and all my stuff was like how can i do stuff with other people mm. um, because it can't be like my thing the point is now eight years later it has to be my thing mm. i have to be out front showing you how i run the business <laughs> like just the opposite and so mm. it's like all right well shit here we go you know like a uh, well, let's get it and try to do this right but it just has changed i just think streetwear is still people like mystery and they like mm-hmm. the you know it's like rappers but um but a lot of the people that are winning are are just out front and the fans feel connected to them i mean 
real is Logan cool now. Paul is like selling thirty million Jesus. dollars a year in merch. God, like, dude, that's a huge clothing line. Those it's, kids, you know, I watch both those two man. They're unbelievable what they're doing. I was yeah. just telling these guys how we're we are part of this changing, and it's funny we're here in L.A. and Hollywood and stuff, and I'm like. Dude, is, is Hollywood going to die in the next 10 years, bro? Is Netflix going to take over movies and yeah. famous people are going to be YouTubers and yeah. shit like that? I mean, it is. All you got to do is look at little kids. I have two kids, and they don't know shit about who's on TV or movies, yeah. but they know who their favorite YouTube stars are. Yeah. We go to the store. We buy stuff based on what the YouTube stars say. Yeah. It, that's the future, oh, man. so crazy. It's so true. But Isn't it's that so, crazy? Imagine if like, like you saw Brad Pitt walking down the street and then like some... Unknown YouTube like, like Logan sh- Paul walking yeah, by, and like kids would be like, Wah! like That's it. to the YouTuber, and it's Brad depressing. Pitt would just yeah. do his thing. They do yeah. events, these yeah. YouTubers do events. That's my kids wanted happening. me to go to one, and I'm like, Who is this guy? I don't know him. And he's like, Oh, he's my favorite YouTuber. They it's open so presents and play with toys or some bullshit. I don't know. Uh, it's so <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> crazy. I, I'm trying so hard not to sound like old and like that's stupid, you know. Yeah, but like, get off my lawn. If that's what it is, that's yeah. what it is. It's going that way. I mean, when you look at Netflix and stuff. I mean, these you're you're seeing these guys. I just saw like just the other day. I saw the first uh, trailer for like a real movie, man. Ma- and, Netflix made. Yeah, and, the one with Will Smith. Yeah, and then the next oh, thing, yeah. and the next thing, you just, and you see when like, you talk about Logan Paul, those guys, they're in movies now. Yeah, yeah, you see them in movies. I mean, it's it's. Coming. Well, think about it. If you're a, if you're a, a movie studio or you're a production studio, you want to make a movie. You got this kid over here with. You know, 20 million subscribers to the YouTube channel. You only got to pay them a half a million dollars to be in your show movie, and you know you're going to have yeah. a guaranteed audience. You ain't going to pay 15 million dollars to Tom Cruise. Fuck, or where's the art, yeah. though? Are yeah, we going to no are shit. we going to lose good shit? Oh man, I don't that, know. Yeah. That's the big question. That's right. where I think we sound old. Because I think <laughs> I think we sound old. I think that our parents, when or let's say our grandparents, right, when like TV first started. They were probably like, you kids, like, you don't know what's real. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I think it was probably the same. Or like when rap music, when, imagine Eminem. Like, right. it was like, you guys do not know music. You're telling me all music is going to be this garbage yeah. and this talentless <laughs> hack. You know yeah. what I mean? Now he's like the legend. I, I, I just, I, I don't know. I think it's. I think it's just how things like evolve and where mm-hmm. it goes. I think it's our perspective. But it's scary. You can't beat him. It looks like us. garbage. Yeah. Yeah. Damn it! Like to me, I watch it and I'm like, "What? The world's over." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, just, I give up. Everyone's gonna be the in talent? their house making vlogs, and that's those are our celebrities now. Uh, excellent. God, God. Man. Well, thanks for ha- letting us talk oh, to you, man. Great, man. Yeah. We could do this for hours. Oh, wow. absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Bro, if you would have brought a blunt, we would have, man. Yeah, don't. Say <laughs> it, man. If you would have brought a blunt, we would have just kept, we would have went two hours plus yeah. easily. Yeah. Next time, we'll next time. You got to you got to come visit us up in, uh, in San Jose. We have a whole studio and everything. We could do all kinds of media. We got video equipment, green screen. We have a whole recording. That's area. awesome, man. I would love to. And anytime, it's like I, the I, Fantasy Factory of podcasting. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just, just, just a lot nerdier. It's a lot of wires. Yeah, yeah. We're all the we're the cool. Yeah, it's really awesome. Yeah, yeah. 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 We're the coolest nerds. No, that's cool, man. I love it. Any, I, anything I can do ever for you guys, or if you'll have me back on or whatever. Oh, I'm for here. sure. Yeah, yeah. No, for no, sure, this brother. Was great, great, great time talking. Appreciate to you, man. it. Yeah. Yeah. Go over to YouTube. Check out Mind Pump TV. We post a new video every single day. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.